welcome back to the movement professional podcast dr richard it's been a <laughs> good few minutes <laughs> yeah it's uh it's good to be back i was away on vacation for a little bit and then um or i guess two weeks away then and yeah i feel like i've been out of it for a little bit so hopefully i kind of remember how to speak but um <laughs> how uh how are things going going well going well yeah just uh moving along same old same old uh summer's almost over so kids are back to school so that changes things but yeah when do they start uh next week wow damn it's creeping up yeah it's been a good summer though weather's been good we've got a lot in they're they're at good ages that you can do stuff with them and they're they're well behaved you know you don't have to you have to supervise but you don't have to like over supervise so it was a fun yeah. year to try new things well that's thanks to you you guys raising them yeah i guess yeah <laughs> it's an ongoing battle <laughs> All right. So today, big episode, we're going to talk about hypertrophy. And so that might not mean a lot to everybody, but it, we can think of it as just building muscle, you know, the idea of building muscle. Um, and we're trying to maybe discuss some misconceptions about, you know, the difference between building muscle, strength, um, weight loss, like other things, and where this term hypertrophy fits into to everything. But it, uh, a lot of times, especially for dudes, it's the the thing that you want to do when you go to the gym, right? I, I think that's what gets a lot of people into the gym. I know that was for me. It's like I wanted to to be jacked, you know, get bigger. So you, you know, it was that idea of trying to be stronger, to have more muscle, show more muscle that made me want to go to the gym in the first place. So I think it's a good discussion. It should be entertaining. Yeah, your absolutely. Thoughts? What's your experience? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think I started going to the gym. Yeah. I mean, honestly, to build muscle, like playing mm -hmm. football, playing lacrosse, I want to get bigger and then also get girls to like me. And, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if the second one ever happened, but it definitely like loved the process of, you know, trying to put on size. And I think that's a driver for a lot of people, whether it's like teenagers looking to get in the gym or, you know, adults getting in it for the first time. Um, it seems like body composition in general is a big part. And part of that is building muscle. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of times the, I, if you're an athlete, right? Like the hypertrophy is often very necessary and, and makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I, I also think that can create some misconceptions about the need for hypertrophy to, you know, in the, in the way that we think about it in, in an athletic perspective, right? So you know, if you think about the body types of some really high level athletes, I mean, it's, it's almost unnatural how, how much muscle they'll have, but also, you know, how little body fat, right? Like it, but with that hypertrophy, with that muscle, oftentimes comes more weight, more load on the body, right? So at, at some point there, there does have to be a discussion of how much is useful and, and what mm -hmm. is the intent, right? So, you know, different sports call for, uh, different size that, you know, and size can often be advantageous, but some sports, you know, the, the intention is to, to stay strong, but you're in a weight class where you have to be light. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think oftentimes the discussion about hypertrophy maybe starts from an athletic perspective, but it gets pulled into maybe just the health and longevity discussion where I think there's a different discussion there. It's still valuable, but it's a different discussion there. Um, but, I, but certainly like going from being a basketball player, to, to just getting into fitness for some reason the first thing i thought of fitness was to build muscle yeah. and but it, it certainly for basketball wouldn't have made me much better there the way that i was training so it, yeah. it depends on the intention it depends on you know you were a lacrosse player so i'm sure it was much more important you probably felt more robust in your position having more mass and, and having more but not every sport um, and not every position in every sport will will have the need for you know, all of that. Yeah, I, I'd agree on that. And yeah, lacrosse was interesting because it's like you have some guys who are pretty big and then mm -hmm. some guys who are, you know, a little smaller and just pretty quick. So it's like, it's an interesting variety of kind of, I think, trying to lean into your strengths a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the biggest help for me was in football, just because you're playing against, I was playing line, offensive right. and defensive line. So it's like, you're just playing against people that are very large and the requirements of that aren't like, yeah, you need to be fast, but you need to be fast relative to other large humans. Right. So, yep. um, you know, I think that's a lot different than like you said, basketball, or even I always think a lot about track and field because mm -hmm. 
you know, speed is the ultimate goal of, you know, any of those foot races. So yeah, there's a relationship between, you know, cross-sectional area of a muscle and actual ability to produce force. But then at the same time, you know, if you weigh more, it takes more energy to move you. So um, delicate balance that I'm sure you kind of experience in basketball. And I think track and field is a big one that stands out as to, you know, even if there aren't specific weight limits, you Mm -hmm. know, where your kind of optimal is for sports performance. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things about hypertrophy, like as you start to feel like you're putting some muscle mass on, and, you know, there's, there's the aesthetic side of it. There's a confidence piece to it as well. Right. So, you know, we can't discount that where you may, depending on how much confidence you need in your, your particular sport, like it could be quite useful to just say like, I'm getting into the gym, I'm getting, I'm feeling stronger, but I'm also putting a little bit of mass on um, and that can really help performance. Um, but you know, outside of that, then we have the the discussion about a lot of times hypertrophy and, and muscle mass gets confused for the same thing as strength. And mm-hmm. I think it is important to make a distinction there. And from from a training perspective, it's it's often quite a bit different now. And, and I do think there's sort of this blending of the two. But I think it's nice to have a, a discussion of sort of the archetypal archetypal like athlete who does like pure strength and the athlete that does like pure kind of hypertrophy work and then you can even think about it like what would their the training programs how would they differ right so if you're you're looking at absolute strength we've talked about this before it's that's sort of your power lifter which again the the name of the sport is a misnomer but it's it's sort of your people who are doing one repetition max heavy deadlift back squat and bench press that's your your typical power lifting and it's all about trying to generate the heaviest rep you possibly can. Um, but the body type, the aesthetic, it, it it's sort of not the point, right? Like that's not mm-hmm. the goal. Um, where if you look at maybe the archetype for hypertrophy, it'll be a bodybuilder, right? And and bodybuilding, you know, you can debate whether you think that's a sport, but it's absolutely the training for it is very specific. Um, and mm-hmm. there is certainly a, a lot that like there's a nutritional piece that's super, super valuable, but then the intention there from a training perspective is to build mass, but do it in a way that also is very um, proportional and and making sure that it eventually you're showing as many of your muscles as you can, but size of the muscle often matters there, right? So, um, and it, it might not, you know, like for absolute strength and, and you have, you'll see the, the difference in the aesthetic of someone who's a power lifter versus somebody who's a bodybuilder. They're, they're often quite different. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one concept that like that I think is helpful and kind of bringing that home a little bit is, Mm -hmm. you know, as a power lifter, you're trying to make, you know, the heaviest weights feel light, like you're trying to move things as efficiently as possible, where oftentimes the process of building muscle is almost the opposite of, you know, you're trying to actually move, make weights harder in a sense, Mm -hmm. um, to actually better stress the tissues you're trying to stress. And yeah, there is a lot of overlap. But I think, that kind of differentiator leads to a much different outcome in terms of physique, um, like you were kind of touching on. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the term you use there is stress. And I think that it kind of boils down to that's, that's the intention above anything else. When we're trying to look at hypertrophy, we're trying to create stress in the muscle, but then the growth actually happens during the recovery. So there's, there's this balance of making sure you're stressing the muscle enough so that as it's healing or as the immune process takes hold and you you recover that it actually comes back stronger you adapt now you have another stimulus that maybe needs to be harder to create that stress so it it is a much more stressful way to exercise when you're trying to work for hypertrophy and i think that's the other reason that it's important to make distinctions because in the line of work that we do when we are working with people that are you know coming off an injury they might be more sensitive to higher stress levels in their their training regimen they can still absolutely do absolute strength work and should and that oftentimes to me that's that's the starting point um that that doesn't mean that you're taking them to failure with weights but you are allowing them to get progressively heavier with their loads but keeping the volume and keeping the stress lower by keeping rest breaks higher you know and not trying to make it as hard as possible but te- teaching people to get better at doing harder things, right? And I think you, you said that quite well, 
because that distinction is huge. And I think that becomes the confusion. And it's almost like you have to convince people that it's okay to not feel like they're working that hard. It's okay to, to rest here because the only thing that matters is the next set, you're doing five more pounds than we did the set before, right? And it's it's this gradual building process, that sort of strength where with hypertrophy, in some ways it's like, you can do so many different things to get hypertrophy. It just has to be pretty hard, right? And I think like there's a more general way to go about building muscle, but it, it does have to be harder. And some people aren't ready for that yet. You know, you kind of have to build them into a hypertrophy phase after they've you know maybe done some work from a strength perspective or just gotten more tolerant to physiological stress. Mm -hmm. How are you, when you're thinking about, you know, actual specifics of training for hypertrophy, like what kind of things are you thinking about from, you know, I know you said a little bit harder, like in terms of, volume intensity like how are what's your thought process kind of like in regards to programming for that so so from a very simple perspective you can kind of go from we've talked about this in past podcasts the idea of five by five 25 total reps would be closer to uh, a strength style workout take that same workout and make it you know eight by eight or five by eight even just like increase the volume um similar weight progressions like but you're just doing more, you know, total reps. Um, and then you can look at it, like volume would actually just be the multiplication of the load and the reps. Like, so just the total amount of work that you're doing, right? So you can think of that as an equation where if you're doing really light reps or like you're not doing much load at all, you got to do a ton of reps to get, and, and they have to be hard reps to get the amount of volume that you would get in with, a heavy weight that you're doing for, for more sets and reps. So like, if you kind of put that in the equation there, you, you have, we have to be, the weight can't be so heavy that you can't get a good amount of reps and sets in. But if it is a bit heavier to start, then you actually don't have to do as much time to, to get the same benefits as if you were doing everything body weight and things like that. So I'm just trying to take, to move the needle with what I'm doing with strength. And just add a little bit more volume to that, which basically looks like more reps, more sets, um, but trying to take them through a similar progression that I took people through with strength at, you know, lower reps, lower sets. So mm -hmm. that's to me is the easiest way to start to blend people in. And it, I'm convinced that they're ready for it because they've gone through a very similar process there. The movements aren't new either. Like, I think it's important to make sure you don't jump into new movements when, and then try to do a lot of volume there. Right? Like if you're yeah. going to learn something new, and I, I think it's hugely valuable to learn new things often, but start that process with low volume, as much rest as you need, not trying to uh, make it too physiological, physiologically stressful so that there's a, a learning process there. But if you've gone through that already, then the next thing to do is just sort of turn the volume up by adding more reps and sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think it's like what you said was, important to note about hypertrophy in terms of like you could do a lot of reps like there's research kind of showing that ranging anywhere from you know six to 30 plus reps like you're going to get a similar hypertrophy outcome right. but probably those 30 plus reps are going to be a lot more fatiguing and exhausting mm -hmm. and hard to do again than something you know probably that more middle lower rep range yeah. anywhere you know six or eight to 12 to 15 whatever it is so mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. And then, you know, the other side of it that I've been kind of looking at and playing around with a little bit more is the intensity side. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, looking at like me, well, I was, I've been like obsessed with different bodybuilders at certain mm -hmm. times and, you know, Dorian, you know, who Dorian Yates is. Yes. yes. Yeah. So he, he was like famous for, taking a pretty incredibly low volume approach to training, mm -hmm. like one set per muscle group, mm -hmm. but, uh, or like three sets per muscle group per week. So like one set per exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, but he would just train everything to absolute failure. Yeah. And I mean, he was incredible, but it's, you know, he's, he's getting a lot of actual, what we call effective reps from those sets where, um, you know, he's pushing to a pretty, highly difficult level mm -hmm. but i think the the difference there you know is in terms of like you had mentioned 
kind of picking new exercises and probably not a good idea with hypertrophy. I think, mm -hmm. you know, probably the higher you want to train with intensity, the more proficient you yes. need to be potentially at the exercise or like the more actually locked in that exercise needs to be, mm -hmm. um, whether that means getting on a machine or whatever, so that you actually like can't, your body can't find another way out. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's just interesting that it's like you have these couple of knob or dials to play with in terms of volume and intensity to kind of figure out, okay, what's the right starting place for me and what do I want to play with? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the highest level people in, in any sport have earned the right to sort of experiment. And then oftentimes they're going to do things that maybe aren't ideal for the person getting started. Right. Because they've, they've kept yeah. their body, you know, one, it takes stress so much better. So like when you ramp up the intensity, I think it still fits into the, the volume equation. A lot of times it's just like the load is really, really amplified. So the, the multiple there is so much higher. Right. And you, you're, the key is you're always bringing your body to close to that physiological stress, which is near failure. Right. So if you're doing 30 reps, they, you can't, stop at 30 when you could have done 50 right like it has to be close to your your rep max right yeah. and so it's like figuring out like how everything works what's best for your body that fits in that window that you're close to to pushing your max um and then yeah th i mean there are changes that happen within the body right it's um you know hormonal changes like different things like that so like if you are taking that idea of high intensity, but like low volume, you have to be pretty strong, right? So you've kind of built that because to be able to tolerate higher intensity means that you've built a lot of strength over time, right? So there is all this wiggle room then. And then I think there's this interplay between strength and hypertrophy, but you sort of have to earn, uh, I think the, the, the way to, to go a little bit lower and vo lower volume. So you, because you could be so high intensity, um, mm -hmm. right. But I think for a lot of our clients and a lot of people that are kind of getting started in there, they, their their intention might be like, I want to look like a bodybuilder, right? But they, you have to sort of think about the path that you might have to go through. And oftentimes that path is it doesn't feel so stressful, doesn't need to feel so stressful at first. It just needs to be like, get on board with this process. And then when you're ready for it, we're going to turn up the volume, right? And the volume, will, but you'll be so ready for it because you, you almost be bored with the things that you've done before. Um, so I think it's just, it, no matter what, there's a sense of patience and then you, you can kind of, as you get more proficient, you can start mixing things up and I can see why somebody who is getting, you know, is been in the sport for a while might want to actually go higher intensity, low volume, because it's probably a better way to recover. Right. But yeah. you have, and, and if it's working because you can go so high in your intensity, you're like, I bet you that might've be, uh, been a strategy as you know, somebody that's really been doing it for a while, it's like, okay, like this works better for me because I can recover a little bit better. Because again, the recovery is a huge part of the anabolic nature of it, the growth, right? So it, it, it's cool to, you know, be able to play with those variables, but I do think they fit within the same concepts. And then it's just like, all right, you can earn the right to go heavier and more intense mm -hmm. when you get stronger. Um, but if we're just thinking about it sort of in a linear fashion, you, you know, you do what you did to, to build more absolute strength. And then you add a little bit of sets and reps to that. Um, and, and, but it's also a matter of, you can look at it as we can be more, we could, you could be more variable with what you do sometimes with hypertrophy. Like, so CrossFit, if, um, if done in a way and you sort of can survive it and you, you get into the, the mix of it, a lot of times that is a mixture of load and volume right but like the reps are really higher than people are used to doing with certain movements yeah. but i think that that definitely promotes a certain amount of hypertrophy but i think there's a there, you just have to be sort of educated on how to turn the volume down for you if what's happening in a group environment might be too much yeah. but definitely that that type of consistent changing of movements but eventually in crossfit as you know right like you're actually practicing a lot of the same movements over it's just that the the workout might be more randomized when you go into any class but after a while and being in that community you start to to know the movements really well that you're training so that type of idea though of saying all right today i might do some kettlebell or uh, bodyweight gymnastic stuff i might go barbell 
and it's it tends to be a, a mixture of weight and and load or um load and uh and reps then you're going to get some hypertrophy there so um you can be i think more creative it could it could yeah. be sometimes more fun but just know that it's it's the most probably the most stressful way of training to the body so there is the, you have to be the most careful i think with not overdoing it yeah and i think that there's like you know, with being able to play with kind of the volume and intensity, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, then you just know, you basically have to get in this ballpark window of like, I need to do some hard sets of a certain range. Mm -hmm. And they can be either, you know, all out or just hard enough. And I think the thing with muscle building or any, you know, change physically is it tends to be pretty slow. So it's like, you just need, I think, generally get in that ballpark and some days are going to feel better than others. But as long as you're kind of hitting that nail consistently, then you're going to start to see those, those results. So um, I think that's just good to know, like, as you've talked about, I think with strength training, it's like the bar on the, on, or the weight on the bar won't necessarily increase ever, mm -hmm. every week exponentially, but as long as you're kind of showing up consistently and working hard, I think things are going to happen. Um, and there's more flexibility in a window than, you know, it may initially seem. Yeah. And I go back to like, if, if someone's looking for more of a linear system that can hopefully protect them from overdoing it, I, I like the idea of it going intensity first, right? Like build your strength, then you add the yep. volume. But when you add the volume, you're, you're still, you're not really caring about how long it takes you to accumulate that volume. You just want to feel like, when you're done, you know, the sets that you were doing were close to failure. Um, but that last piece, which looks to me a little bit more like CrossFit workouts is density, where it's like, you could, the, the same movements that you've gone through an intensity and volume phase with start to, to mix in some interval timers with that as like, get as many reps done as you can in a small amount of time or a, 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 an allotted amount of time. And that also, to me, definitely promotes more uh, hypertrophy. But the weights might have to become a little bit lighter, but the reps are going higher. So again, we're playing with this same volume equation of what's the load and then what's the reps and sets and putting that all together. But I think density to me goes after volume because volume, like there's no rush. You just got to get it in, right? So yeah. different ways to get volume could be, all right, we'll say like I get, I want to do a certain weight, but I can't get eight reps in one set. Like I, I go pretty close to failure at five. Well, maybe I take a two minute break and I do three more, but by the end of that day or by the end of that week, I've gotten the same amount of reps that my goal was. And that, that amount of reps should be more than it was my previous phase. Right. So you can spread that out as much as you want. And I, like I have a kind of a unique situation and you do too, where we, you know, we work in gyms. So I find that I'm not doing like single workouts. I'm doing like, I'm sprinkling in, volume throughout the course of the day and half hour blocks because that's when i have stuff between clients and that to me works just as well as like trying to blast it in like a two hour you know period without rest um but then there'll be times like i want to get my whole workout in in a half hour that's more density work right like i, I have to see if i can get all the volume in in less time well that i'm not going to do that where i'm closer to like max effort or i feel like the the movement's more complex or more stressful but I'll do that with some movements I'm more confident in. So I think you you could play with that. It's all hypertrophy in a way, but it depends on what you feel confident in. And, and just know, I think that the density piece, when you put that time limit in there, it's probably where it's the most risky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree on that. Looking at, you know, you mentioned, especially with bodybuilders, like the importance of nutrition. I think the big thing people talk about is protein consumption um you know in terms of recovery but also in terms of building muscle what you know what do you have to say about that where do, where does your head go um along those lines in terms yeah. of recommendations and it's it, it, my mentality on protein has changed a lot over the years and it's not that i really had like a belief system in it i just didn't i didn't think about it as much as i thought about other things um but be, like when i was vegan you know, like I tried to get a certain amount of protein in doing that. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't prioritizing it. And then I did things like intermittent fasting where uh, I felt good. And but I, I definitely wasn't mindful of like windows of getting protein in. Um, I would try to get maybe a lot of protein in one meal. Um, but I think like 
more now I'm, I'm convinced that it's important that if you're going to space meals out throughout the course of the day, you do it for protein specific purposes, because I do think there is like only so much protein you can absorb. And this is just something I've heard and from people that know a lot more about nutrition than, than I do, um, that it there's, it's pretty legitimate that like you eat like 150 grams in one meal, one, you're probably going to be gassy and bloated, but you're probably not going to you get the value of that versus if you spread that out throughout the course of the day. Um, but I, I tend to go for the one gram of protein per body weight. Uh, and I recommend that to a lot of my clients. You could, I think you can do more. I think people tend to be way under that. So just seeing like, what's your baseline? Can you get closer to one gram, you know, per pound of body weight? Like that, that becomes a starting point. Um, and then again, I think it becomes the, the goal you know, we'll tell you whether you want to go more, if there's any GI distress or anything like that, yeah. you, you assess that when you're going more. Um, but I, I've, I've, that's become much more of a foundation of what I talk to clients about is what, what, what they're doing outside of the sessions, at least there's, you know, how's your protein intake right now? Um, I find people are less sensitive to that discussion than they are to like, are you tracking how many calories you're eating or something like that? Yeah. But just the, the, thought process about like, do you, are, do you know how much protein you're getting, you know, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis? Um, I think that that moves the needle to a discussion about like, okay, what are the most optimal sources of protein? Um, and are you trying to lose weight? Or are you trying to gain weight while you're trying to, um, you know, have more protein that, that tells you like what sources might be better or worse for you. Yeah. We always, I feel like, you know, my first conversation with people around that after, mm -hmm you know, potentially finding out that they're under eating it, which like you said, most people tend to be, I would say, mm -hmm. it's like, all right, let's figure out a way to get, you know, 30 grams at breakfast and then just cut yep. or 40 grams, whatever set mm -hmm. hit, right. get a good amount of breakfast that kind of sets you up for the rest of the day. Yep. Cause I think that's often one of the top places where it's lacking yep. um, just among like traditional breakfast foods that most people eat. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've sort of separated out the idea of protein from meals um, in my like nutritional plan, but also in discussing things with clients. Now, it can be part of a full meal, but mm -hmm. um, especially people that have gotten used to maybe not doing breakfast, just saying like, all right, you don't have to have a meal in the morning, because I think that can be a hard switch when your your body's not used to it. If you wake up really early to just say like, all right, make sure don't even think about it as food, just Think of it as like you're taking a supplement or something in the morning. Now, and it can be food, right? It can be a protein smoothie. It can be yogurt. It could be just something that's easy to get down, right? And that becomes a lot of times the discussion about how many different ways that are convenient can you get that protein, but it, don't think of it like a meal. Don't think of it like breakfast. Just think of it like you'd be taking fish oil or something like that. Because to me, it's, it's that important, especially for, for most people's goals. And it doesn't have to get in the way of other like behavioral strategies for, you know, consuming less, right? So that's where I, I sort of like blended my messing around with fasting into get, making sure I got enough protein throughout the course of the day. But I don't think of it as like sitting down for lunch. I just was like, all right, if I'm going to eat, it's going to be protein and pretty much that's it. Just so mm -hmm. I can get, you know, the 30 to 40 grams that I want a couple times a day. And then it actually makes it easier at night. Like I still have a lot of calories to eat. Like my, my night meal is still the biggest, but I don't have to go like nuts on the protein at night. So, you know, I can feel, feel a little bit more comfortable in the GI track. And then also like, I actually have more room to eat other things at night because I took care of the protein a lot more throughout the course of the day. Yeah. We've been talking a little bit about, I think, hypertrophy generally. And like mm -hmm. we touched on it with athletics, but I think one of the, the biggest places and most significant um, places that it kind of fits in is talking about, you know, healthy aging, healthy longevity, and the idea of health span versus lifespan. Um, you want to touch a little bit on that, especially in regards to sarcopenia, um, which is, you know, losing muscle mass as we age. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, you know, like oftentimes the discussion about protein, it, it's, it's in the bodybuilding world all the time, right? But it's, it's likely more important just for general health for the people who are losing muscle and you lose muscle as you age. And also it ties into bone density, right? So you've heard, uh, most people have heard of osteopenia, which is like a precursor to osteoporosis, just a, you know, kind of a loss in, in bone. Uh, so 
it's very normal as you age to lose muscle and and to lose some bone density. So getting more muscle mass helps to combat both of those. So the things, the strategies that bodybuilders would use to try to, you know, build muscle mass, like it, it often becomes more important to do that as you get older. You're just not yeah. necessarily going to look the same as the bodybuilder, but you might want to take on similar strategies. So protein intake becomes more important as you age. And it's oftentimes the the people that are older that are thinking less about it, you know, in, in my experience. And there's um, where it's like when you're in the, the your kind of middle years of starting to put mass on, that's when you start thinking about it. So I think shifting that thought process to later on and saying like, okay, what what is life taking for me as I age? All right, so how do I combat that? I have to think about what are the optimal strategies for for building muscle. So um, the before, like if people aren't ready for the physiological stress, they should be ready for gradually increasing protein. And that's oftentimes a safer way to get started in the process of being able to, to tolerate the, the training load that you might need to build muscle. Yeah. I mean, that's, I feel like that's where all this stuff honestly matters the most is as, as we age, like that's kind of what, at the end of the day, I think most of us are training for, whether mm -hmm. we know it or not to be. Right feel good and be generally healthy as we get older. Um, so I think th this is such an important part of that whole conversation. Absolutely. And I think like the piece about bone density is like you, the people that are more susceptible to bone density issues tend to be those who actually are very low weight, like lower body weight, right? Yeah. So it, and so putting muscle mass on is actually a way of like, in, in a maybe aesthetically more aesthetically pleasing way of actually gaining weight in, in a way that would help bone density. Right. So you can think of it that way, where it's like, it's a more uh, suitable way for people to look at gaining weight, but it's just also like walking around muscle weighs more than fat. Right. So if you're walking around with more muscle, you should be walking around with a little bit more load through the bones, which can, can be useful there. So, you know, you're, you're trying to, we're doing different exercises to try to load the bones directly, but oftentimes those can be some of the best exercises to also physiologically stress the body and, and grow muscle too. But having a frame with more muscle should be useful for bone density because you, you see, you know, the heavier you are, usually the, the less problems with uh, bone density. Yeah, it's, it's scary. I mean, I think of, um, you know, my mom and, you know, other other women i i mean it applies to men too but i think it um generally osteopenia osteoporosis tends to affect women i think more yeah. than men um and it's just something where you know when you're personally invested in it it's it's so important yeah um so yeah it's it's just a huge part of it and i think the bone density piece is you know equally as as big as the actual muscle building and like you were talking about the actual relationship um associated between those you know is is vital absolutely and i think uh, it's a good conversation right and just you know trying to put hypertrophy in, it's it's definitely valuable just know like when to use it and try not to go there maybe too early without you know kind of like earning the right to to build that physiological stress in, in your regimen um and and just appreciate that it's it's more than just for for athletes. It's more it's it's probably more important when you're outside of that and, and later in life. Yep. All right. We will pick up again next week. Good to have you back. All right. Good to be back. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon.